Hello and welcome to the Plumes of Oz, where we look at the Australian birds in the wild. And this episode is all about terns. It will be a delight. For the first place that we will go and study terns is on the Barrier Reef, where small sand caves just sit above the sea level, providing an island habitat where birds breed and roost. We have heard that the brown boobies are in the breeding season at this point, but what we are after are terns, and we hope there is evidence that the terns are also breeding. As the boat gets closer, we can hear a cacophony of tern calls, and we can see the terns flying through the tropic skies over this small sand cave. Frigate birds perch on top of a dead tree, gaining the highest point looking out over the sea, looking for terns that have caught a large fish so it can startle them in flight, hoping the fish will drop and they can get an easy meal. With the terns in flight, we can see that they have a white belly and a white underwing, but as they turn, the top covering of the wing is dark. And look at that dark mass of birds on the foreshore. This is the crash of the fledglings. The parents both go out to fish and they leave the young birds in the care of carers at this nursery. In flight, they have deep wing movements. There is a swallow tail, so we know they are terns. And in the tropics, the white belly with the sooty top tells us immediately they are sooty terns. Brown boobies sitting on the nest, surrounded by terns and noddies. But remember, Noddies are terns that nod their head, and above, the sooty tern flying. As they fly to the coral cave, so they incessantly call and await a response call from their partner. Notice how the birds have a hovering, fluttering motion typical of terns. Laros is an ancient Greek word used to describe seabirds. Terns are seabirds of the family Laridae derived from the Greek Laros. And in Australia, we have approximately eight genera with twice that number of species. Terns have a black cap, gray above and white below, but this little bird, the sooty tern, is an exception. As its name suggests, it has black above and on the outer aspect of the wings. And the chicks and juveniles are also dark with a spotted appearance. A juvenile in flight, you can see the spots on the wing. The non-flyers remain at a crèche, watched over by a few helpers, for they have such a voluminous appetite that both adults need to go out and catch fish. In the crèche, the main role of the helpers is to keep the seagulls away from picking the chicks or separating them from the main crèche, for here the seagulls are birds of prey. The nest for a sooty tern for most part is a simple scrape on the ground on which the bird sits to incubate the eggs. Another collection of sooty tern chicks, all waiting to fledge. While on the barrier reef, we want to look at the second tropical tern, the common noddy. We've already seen a few shots of it, but before we do so, Let's look at a classic tern so we can get some idea of what a tern bird is like. And here it is. This is the crested tern, the most common tern along the Australian eastern seaboard. Web feet, a bill longer than the head and slightly down curved. In this case, it is yellow. A black cap and what we call grey uppers and pale downside or on the belly. And a tail mixed with black, grey and white. These are the classic tones for what we would consider as a turn, but not the noddy. The common noddy, instead of having a black cap, has a pale grey cap. Instead of being pale under, he is dark under and over, with the exception of the pale cap. This is very near the reverse of contrast to what we normally regard as the tone of a sea turn. Let's look at this brown noddy as it goes to find its mate after coming in from fishing. Nodding happens more in the breeding mode, but they will nod as a sign of partner awareness. Both partners nod, not just the male, but both sexes. 
and if one of the pair is looking after the chicks, the mate will bring in food and regurgitate. This is in contrast to some of the other terns that bring in live fish. So a lot of the head bobbing has to do with do you or do you not have food? And like all other terns, so the noddies are very colony orientated, as you can see here, where there's both adults and young. The binomial name for the common or the brown noddy is Anus stolidus. Anus meaning foolish and stolidus meaning stupid. The brown noddy derived its name of stupid bird in the equatorial regions of the Pacific where the islanders traditionally would both harvest the eggs and catch the birds for food. But year after year the noddies returned to the same breeding site, hence the concept of being stupid despite the predation. There are four subspecies of the common noddy throughout the equatorial regions of the Indo-Pacific. Some breeding in rock caves, some breeding on trees, some breeding on the sand. The Australian subspecies is Pylatus. Again, the common noddy or brown noddy as it's sometimes called, breeds on a scrape on the ground. But this is one of the terns that will also breed in a tree, making a nest. I mentioned that there weren't many predators on these small coral islands, but it's not quite correct because one of the predators is the common silver gull. The seagulls are constantly on the fly looking for unattended nests where there is an egg. It will crack the shell and devour the contents, making it the number one bird of prey on these small atolls. A total reversal of what happens when it's breeding on its own little island. Seagulls, though not terns, breed like terns on the coastal islands off the mainland of Australia. And in the breeding moments, the numbers on these small islands can be extremely high. This brings in the predators, the main one being the sea eagle. So many birds can be the prey, then changing to the aggressor. And after fish, the seagull is the second most favourite dish for a sea eagle. One further problem of the equatorial terns is the loss of island habitat. Remember seeing the frigate birds on top of those small dead trees? Once those trees were alive, but with global warming, hurricanes are now more frequent and ferocious, ripping away the trees and vegetation, eroding the island and disturbing the breeding habitat. Now we're going to leave the tropics and the noddies and move further south looking at the classic terns with the grey uppers, the white unders and the black caps. Identifying terns can be difficult but a large orange bill certainly stands out in this case and this is a Caspian tern. But the second bird on the left is rather motley in its appearance and this is an immature bird. Often in the immature terns you will see this slight rufous colour but here we can tell that it is a young one because it was begging. Like all the terns that we've looked at so far, the Caspian tern is a diving tern. It dives and feeds on fish. Caspian terns have a wide distribution throughout the world along the coasts and sometimes inland in the temperate and equatorial zones. The exception is South America where they are uncommon. Recently, with global warming, there have been reports of the Caspian tern breeding further north, even to Alaska. Caspian terns are monophyletic. There are no subspecies. The name Caspia comes from the Caspian area where they fish and breed in the lakes in summer. Caspian terns are the largest of all the terns. Identification of the Caspian tern is usually easy because it is the largest of the terns and has a prominent red bill. The black cap of the Caspian tern is often more grey, implying it's an immature bird. When the black cap goes really black, it's in breeding mode. And this change in the black of the cap going into breeding mode is a feature of most terns. Caspian terns are also colony birds, but not as intense in their colony structure as we have seen in the large colonies of the sooty tern. The largest group that I have seen roosting together is 30 birds, but then they were all at a good distance. 
Another feature of Caspian terns is that when they are roosting, they are often at the same site as other waders or terns. Terns often cohabit, as the Caspian and the gull build here, confirming the saying that one good tern deserves another. But the diet of a gull build and a Caspian are poles apart. The Caspian is mostly a fish eater or pescatarian, whereas the gull build feeds more off the surface of the water, picking up insects and also eating crustaceans. The gull build turn in flight. Watch now as it comes down, it only goes to the surface. See that? Its head didn't go underwater. It didn't plunge dive, it just collected off the surface. When in flight, most terns while hunting over water will have their heads down, searching and scouring the water for edible food or fish. Here on this sandbar in the Hunter River estuary is a typical collection of gull-billed terns, all with black caps in breeding plumage. Here, the bird, second to the left, doesn't have a black cap. It is having a bath. It does have black around the eye, but the cap is pale, only a slight grey. This is a gull-billed tern, but immature. It is not in breeding plumage. We saw with the Caspians, the darker the cap, the more likely it is to be in breeding mode. And so the same applies to the gull-billed tern. In this group of gull-billed terns, most of the birds have pale heads. To the left, there are three birds with darker caps. The pale caps are very pale and I suspect juvenile birds. A young gull-billed tern begging from the adult. And again, the adult has the intense black cap. The pale grey cap of the juvenile has slight striations over it. And the only darks of the juvenile are about the eye. Again, this juvenile has slight rufous tinging to it. The other non-breeding bird on the far left lacks the rufous and is probably an immature non-breeder. Here on this tidal sandbar, the tidal crustaceans move out of their burrows and are exposed only to be eaten by any foraging gull-billed tern. As with most birds, there is always confusion with subspecies. The gull-billed in the centre only has grey behind the eye. And this is the oriental gull-billed that lives and breeds in the Sea of Japan area, then overwinters coming south to the equatorial regions. Not a great deal of difference to our non-breeding gull-billed in Australia. This oriental gull build usually only comes down to Darwin. Now with global warming, this bird has moved further south to lower latitudes and on this occasion was photographed at the Hunter River estuary. Terns roosting on a sandbar, one large and one small. The small tern is called the little tern and the large one is called the white fronted tern. There are four subspecies of little terns and they have a wide distribution throughout the world. The subspecies in Australia is called placens, meaning charming. These birds breed on the beaches in the sand. They are swift flyers, and despite their small size, little terns are good at fishing, but they do prefer calmer waters of estuaries. The immature little terns are more pale, with delay in the development of the black, in particular, the black cap. The little tern is also one of the yellow-billed terns, and we will look at more of these soon. Another water surface feeder is the whiskered tern, and both the gull-billed and the whiskered tern are found more over still waters, feeding on insects, so they are often found in marsh areas, more than over the sea. The belly of the whiskered tern is whisked with black, and the genus name is Clodonius, from the Greek meaning a swallow appearance for most terns do have a swallow-like tail. The whiskered tern is often called a marsh tern because it lives and breeds in the marshes. The only other bird that also does this in Australia is the white-winged black tern. To skim insects off the surface of a lake requires still water. So the whiskered tern is found more on calm marsh waters the whiskered tern is one of the few terns that can also feed on the fly. The images presented here are in New South Wales, for it follows the insects south in summer, and though it can plunge dive, most of its feeding is done from the surface 
eating more insects than fish. As it returns north in winter, so it will lose its breeding plumage. The cap will go grey, the belly will go white, and the bill return to black. A colony of terns on the eastern seaboard of Australia. Crested terns, both adult and immature. The genus name for the crested tern is Thalassius, meaning fisherman. Plunge diving, the crested tern is an excellent fisherman. Here on the barrier reef you can see crested terns bringing in fish to give to their partners as they enter into breeding mode. The crested tern is the most commonly seen tern on the east coast of Australia. To look at the crested tern in a little bit more detail I want to take you back to the New South Wales coastline. Just south of the Hunter River there is a rock shelf. It's only at extreme high tides that the rocks are covered, so it provides an ideal roosting site for terns. And here we will look at the crested tern in detail. Narrow wings and deep strokes. These are characteristic of terns. They glide over the surface of the water at various altitudes, scouring for fish. This one is not in fishing mode because its head is turned forwards. It is looking at where to go and roost. And here on the Newcastle rock shelf, the terns fly in after fishing. The crested tern is a plunge diver. He will dive for fish just below the surface of the water. Back at the rock shelf colony, the terns are calling. A lot of this is just the young birds incessantly calling for the adult to come and feed it. Here is a typical young crested tern. And another one begging from the adult. Crested terns are very good at fishing and they will bring the fish in and do a comparison Amongst these young immature terns you can see them bragging about the size of their fish and at the same time instructing the juveniles about what fish to catch. Unlike some of the other terns that regurgitate the food for their partners, the crested tern will offer fresh fish to its partner. And if the partner accepts the fish, there are consequences and copulation and breeding eventuates. And typical of terns, where there's a colony, often there are other terns present, like this little tern. Other shorebird waders also come into the rock shelf to rest and roost, like the turnstones and the oyster catchers. However, on this rock shelf, I am after one particular tern. The terns that we've looked at so far breed in Australia and have counterpart subspecies in other continents of the world. But there is one distinctive turn that we're looking for, and here it is, roosting at the outer limits of the rock shelf, in combination with crested tern. When thinking of terns in Australia, we often think of the common tern, the arctic tern, Aleutian terns, the northern hemisphere tern that do enormous flight, getting away from winter into the southern hemisphere. This little tern is called the white fronted tern, and is distinguished for it is a tern that lives and breeds only in the southern hemisphere. Here it goes in flight. Notice that the birds that it left were mostly crested terns with yellow bills, but this bird has a black bill. And as it comes to land, on the rock platform at the back of the baths, it joins other terns. It is winter. The crested terns are here all year, but look, there are multiple white-fronted terns. The genus name Sterner is an old Gaelic term for seabird. And the white-fronted spinomial name is Sterner striata. Here on the rock shelf in July, there is a good representation of white-fronted New Zealand terns. Roosting with them are the local crested terns and silver gulls. I think of the white-fronted tern as a kiwi tern, for this bird breeds in New Zealand and overwinters on the east coast of Australia. There is a geographic subspecies breeding on islands in the Bass Strait, but this is very rare. 
and the greater majority of white-fronted terns seen on the east coast are the New Zealand bred birds. Now we think of the common tern and its enormous flight from the northern hemisphere to Australia, but the white-fronted tern's direct flight from New Zealand to Australia is also significant, for there are no islands for it to stop and rest, whereas the flight of the common tern, though it is longer, has the advantage of island hopping. This white-fronted tern is an immature bird, for the bridge between the black bill and the black crown is large, and this is the white front, always present in the white-fronted tern. But in breeding mode, this little white bridge becomes very narrow. Here, look at this bird. That white bridge has narrowed, for this bird is in breeding mode. Rather exciting when you see it in Australia. However, that is rare, and most of the birds are in non-breeding plumage, with an incomplete black cap. They will go back to New Zealand to breed. So with this view of the white-fronted and the crested terns, we will conclude this part one of Australian terns. On behalf of Plumes of Oz, I hope you've enjoyed this video on the terns in Australia. If you subscribe, you will get automatic notification of when part two or the comic terns will be released.